Okay, so my name is Thomas. I work for the Eclipse Foundation. And today I would like to present uh, uh, how we at the Eclipse Foundation, uh, we are trying to police uh, open source project at scale. Um, to come back to, to the talk before, the discussion before, um, it's becoming um, apparent that uh, software supply chain security is becoming more and more important. Um, securing the software repositories, so the platforms where uh, the development is actually happening, is becoming a much more important aspect of it. Um, you are supposed to follow uh, certain security best practices, for example, setting up branch protection rules, um, enabling certain features like secret scanning, dependable about security updates. Um, it's also very important to um, communicate to your users and your community what is your security policy, how are you going to handle um, vulnerabilities that are being reported for your uh, software, how can actually the community or users uh, report such things to your uh, repository in a secure and uh, responsible way. And um, on top of that is of course, um, so when you only are concerned with a single repository, that might not be of an issue. But if you have to do that at scale with um, potentially thousands of repositories, how do you monitor that all these things are in place? And how do you remediate uh, if things are missing or are not as they are supposed to be? Yeah? So this is what I would like to talk uh, today. Um, so a bit details about myself. Um, so I work as a security engineer for the Eclipse Foundation. Um, I'm, of course, naturally interested in uh, uh, software uh, repository security and uh, software supply chain security in general. Um, so what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, so we are helping uh, with handling security reports for uh, projects of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, and we also develop tools and services uh, that help our projects to um, follow best practices or simply to, to uh, help in their day-to-day -day life. Huh? Um, so, most of you are probably familiar with the Eclipse Foundation, so we uh, are the home to many open source projects. Um, some of them are pretty known and, and, and uh, used a lot. Um, for example, uh, uh, Temuin, which is a, a Java distribution that is yeah, uh, gaining a lot of traction, and uh, I think it's one of the most used uh, uh, Java distributions uh, worldwide. But there are also other projects um, that are quite heavily used and uh, also receive uh, quite some um, uh, reports about vulnerabilities and, and basically we have to um, uh, step up our, our game to make sure that uh, all these things are handled uh, properly and uh, in, in a timely manner. So um, when we talk about scale, what do we mean by that actually? Yeah? So, um, so uh, at the moment we have uh, 176 GitHub organizations uh, hosting our projects um, and becoming more and more of course on a daily basis. Um, in total we have currently at GitHub uh, alone more than 1,700 uh, repositories. Um, so you can imagine that uh, making sure that all of these repositories follow uh, the best practices or what are even the settings of these uh, repositories um, can be quite a tedious task to uh, achieve if you have to do that manually. Um, so what are our requirements actually to, to do that at scale? So uh, what we want to have, uh, of course, is, is some kind of a baseline. A baseline that would say uh, these are deemed to be uh, secure settings. Uh, if you don't have special needs, you are basically safe to to use these settings. And so we would like to have a definition of these settings somewhere. People can look at them and can argue whether they are applicable to their project, but at least uh, they can serve as a baseline. Um, then also we have a very specific requirement that um, maybe many projects or foundations don't have is uh, we also would like to um, support uh, a few settings that are not easily accessible by an API. Huh? Um, GitHub itself, for example, uh, has very powerful APIs and also a very nice UI to uh, set up things. Uh, however, if you would like to do that at scale, um, you, you have to do that in an automated way huh? because otherwise you cannot like log in uh, to uh, 170 organizations and check uh, which settings uh, there are at the moment and, and change them uh, whenever you, you have to. Uh. 
So you need ways to do that uh, as automated uh, as possible. Um, another very important uh, factor for us is um, because all these projects exist, um, they are there sometimes even for, for 10, 15, 20 years, um, we need a way to basically be non-disruptive at setup time. Uh, so we would like to start right away without having to come up with a configuration at first uh, manually. So we would like to, to import the existing settings and the existing configurations uh, without uh, needing the people to actually come up with something like this. So when you think about Terraform, you, it's a very nice tool, but you have to set up your, your configuration at first. Um, if you have already like thousand repos doing that by hand, yeah, people will not be happy. Um, Another important fact is uh, we would like to monitor uh, monitor that at, uh, at a continuous uh, uh, rate. So we would like to see are the settings uh, as they should be, or for example, uh, where are areas um, uh, that, that still need improvement. For example, is secret scanning already enabled uh, in all repos repositories or not? And where do we have to enable it? Huh? So, and also querying capability is there uh, quite important. Uh, because we would like to uh, understand exactly uh, which uh, projects or which repositories uh, need some some love. Um, then on top of that, of course, um, so, so that is basically the baseline, I would say. You need to know uh, what is the current configuration of all your uh, repositories and projects. On top of that, then you would like to enforce uh, some policies where you say this we deem to be uh, important or required for a project to, to adhere to. Huh? Uh, imagine a simple policy could be to say, um, we would like to have secret scanning enabled for all repositories uh, because it's, you get it for free and basically can save your day uh, in order to prevent you to, to push some uh, secrets to a repository that is invisible by everybody and you have to remediate that, and which is a lot of work. Um, so if you can prevent that, uh, uh, of course, it, it would be quite useful. Um, so with all these options uh, or requirements uh, in, in, in mind, uh, we, of course, we are looking at, at various uh, options that are available on the market right now. So there are lots of tools out there that can help you with this. Um, and some of them are really amazing tools. However, they only uh, cover part of what we actually needed. Huh? Um, um, especially uh, GitHub itself offers something like uh, enterprise uh, policies um, where you can specify on, on, on enterprise level uh, what settings are required uh, for all your organizations in the enterprise, which is of course a neat way to do that, but it's also not very flexible huh? because when you specify a policy, you basically, everybody has to adhere to that. Um, we are now in a situation where we have like more than 100, 200 projects on GitHub alone. And we cannot say from one day to another, you have to follow not exactly that, uh, that, that principle, that, that policy, whatever. And that would lead to a lot of um, um, uh, resistance from the projects. So we have to do that basically step by step. Um, uh, that's why an option like that is usually not, not really um, suitable for us. There are other uh, uh, tools from, from other foundations, especially I, I would like to mention the, the Apache Software Foundation, which has a solution that is also very nice, uh, which I really like, is uh, it allows to uh, specify uh, on a repo level with a, speci a specific uh, configuration file to, um, to define exactly what, what, what settings you would like to have for this repository. Uh, you can set up, for example, branch protection rules like that. Um, you commit that to the repo and then some automatic uh, process detects that and will apply these uh, things on, on this repository. However, um, in our case, we wanted to go a bit further than that um, uh, because we not only want to uh, set the settings for existing things, we also would like to have a system similar to Terraform where we say we can also create resources, we can delete them if they are not needed anymore, we can change them as, 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 as required. Um, so with all these uh, requirements in mind and all the available options, we basically came to the conclusion that um, we need something ourselves or develop something ourselves. So 
the design is similar to Terraform, I would say. Um, the configuration or the, the, the modeling uh, language that we use uh, um, is different. So we use JSONNet for that. Um, there are different reasons for that. Uh, one of them, it's, it's very powerful. It's a templating engine for, for JSON. Um, it's already used at the Eclipse Foundation uh, for quite some time. So we use that also to uh, set up and configure lots of other services, uh, mainly uh, CI systems based on Jenkins. So every project um, uh, has uh, access to a separate uh, Jenkins instance. And this instance is being uh, provisioned uh, based on JSONnet configuration files. And so we have already quite some experience doing that and that's why it was more like a, a natural uh, target for us to, to also do something similar like, uh, that, like that for, for the configuration of, of um, GitHub repositories. Um, one of the nice things uh, of JSONnet compared to other solutions that, that uh, basically I've uh, shown before, they mainly use YAML, which is very nice and, and very easy to learn and use. The disadvantage is, is of, of YAML is you cannot customize things as much as you want them. Um, in our case, we have lots of lots of projects, um, lots of customization, and um, usually it's not one size fits not all in, in our case. So we, we would like to have customization as much as possible. So that's why JSONnet becomes like a natural target for us. Um, where do we actually host that configuration? Huh? So um, we would like to be uh, open and transparent about what we do also uh, with regard to our community because the community uh, needs to know also what is their configuration. So th we don't want to keep that private um, unless of course it's, it's some sensitive data that cannot be shared. So we decided to uh, create a separate uh, repository in each organization uh, named .eclipsefdn similar to .github. So it's related to configurations and, and, and things uh, for the Eclipse Foundation, uh, where this configuration is then uh, being stored and can also be uh, modified and, and, uh, and, and changed uh, to your needs, and provide uh, CLI tools uh, for administration. Uh, that's mainly for ourselves, but also uh, a GitHub app that automatically um, applies these changes once they have been approved and merged into this repository. Huh? Um, so I will show this later how, how this looks like. Um, but first of all, um, so this solution is of course open source. Um, so it's also this, uh, accessible on GitHub. So we have a separate organization for, for services and tools related to uh, security, uh, Eclipse CSI, and Autodoc is one of them. Um, so everybody is of course uh, <laughs> welcome to uh, to contribute to that or use it or provide feedback uh, or ideas for improvement. Um, so we have uh, so far um, support for quite a lot of resources and configurations that are possible on GitHub. Um, of course, mainly repositories with all their settings, um, secrets, branch protection rules, environments, uh, workflow uh, rules uh, or settings. Um, Rule sets, which is also a relatively uh, recent feature of GitHub. Um, the mo important thing for us is we support adding, deleting, and modifying of resources. Um, There's also important for um, um, empowering our projects to, to do self-service as, as much as possible. Huh? Because for historical reasons, uh, people would have to actually uh, file, for example, a help desk issue, uh, issue if they would like a new repository being created or if some settings have to be changed, um, which is tedious, can take a while. So with this uh, uh, new approach, um, the projects can do that themselves most of the time. They can create a pull request. Um, if this gets approved by a project lead, for example, it gets applied automatically and everything is like, uh, can be done within minutes if, if, uh, if they follow uh, uh, the, the, the process. Yeah. Um, one thing that is also uh, uh, quite uh, important is um, 
what to do with uh, renaming of resources huh? because uh, some resources you actually can recreate quite easily. Uh, think about a webhook or uh, a branch protection rules. Um, if you delete them, you can just like create them new and, and basically no information is lost. For repositories, it's a bit different. Huh? You don't want to delete the repository. <laughs> Uh, on GitHub, of course, uh, there is now uh, support for restoring deleted repositories, but you don't want to rely on that because it also can fail. Um, so that's why we also added support that um, some resources you can rename. Why is this actually a, a thing? Because our solution is stateless. Uh, so we have a configuration file. We don't keep state uh, about uh, what is currently uh, applied to to. to, to to GitHub in a similar way as Terraform, we don't do that. So we are completely stateless. So uh, we have a configuration file and we check uh, what changes need to be done based uh, on comparing with the live settings. Um, that has some advantages, but the disadvantage is that you cannot uh, really detect uh, renaming out of the box. So you need some tricks to uh, actually support that, but yeah, um, we have this there. Um, Another important fact is uh, that we also have support for uh, settings that are only accessible via the web, web UI. Uh, so how do we do that? So we use uh, um, web scraping uh, tool works, uh, tool, uh, frameworks like uh, Playwright to access uh, the web UI and uh, extract data from there and also apply changes if, if necessary. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why we actually could not really use one of the other tools because the integration with Playwright and, and also the credential management in order to access uh, um, a user um, in the web UI required some changes that, that were not easily uh, applicable to, to all, the, all the other tools. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you can see that. So here is how a configuration looks like in this JSONnet format. Um, you see at the top, uh, where the default configuration is uh, included. Um, and then you can define resources with uh, simple um, template functions that basically already carry the default values in them, but you can override the settings as needed. Huh? So here in this case, we define uh, a new uh, GitHub organization with the name Eclipse CSI. It has some settings where we set uh, the description, um, some other things. And all the other things are already inherited from the default configuration and you don't, you don't have to change them. So basically this file serves as, as a diff to the default configuration. So everything that is different from the default configuration you will see in this file. Um, um, here you see some other uh, cases like uh, adding a new resource uh, like a repository. And at the bottom you see you can override basically any settings uh, that you deem to be necessary uh, for your case. Some things will be naturally overridden, like a description, of course, but other things usually uh, stay the same unless you want to have them different in, in your uh, case. Um, so this is how uh, the default configuration looks like. Naturally, of course, it's, uh, it's public. Uh, it's also on GitHub. Um, here you see uh, the definition for every resource. There is a, a template function with all the settings uh, that we deem to be like reasonable as a default. Um, but yeah, as I said, uh, every project can decide to override them uh, if necessary. Um, maybe a, a small trivia. Uh, we also use that uh, tool uh, ourselves to uh, um, create the .eclipse FDN repositories ourselves. So in the default configuration, there is a section uh, about creating this repository. Um, this is how it looks like. Um, so you have some settings um, and then it has defined some branch protection rule. Uh, and the first time this tool is being uh, uh, used to uh, import an, an, a new GitHub organization, uh, this repository gets uh, automatically created. Huh? So that's... Um, it's a nice side effect of, of the tool. Huh? Okay, um, so I, I wanted to show here um, the reasons why we also use uh, JSONnet. It really allows you to, um, to customize as much as possible using a relatively straightforward uh, language. 
So this is an example from, from one of our uh, um, high profile uh, projects. So that's from, from Adoptium Temorin project. Um, so they have lots uh, of repositories that are also follow a, a common convention. Um, so in this case, for example, they have uh, binary repos where they store all the uh, different versions of the uh, Java distributions for the different um, Java versions. And um, they would like to create them with the same settings. Huh? And they use, uh, of course, some templating in there uh, because some things are different between these repos. Um, with this approach, uh, it's very really simple to create your own template function where you say, uh, this is how uh, a repository like this uh, should actually be configured. And then you can use this template function to just create them um, um, like on the right side, you see that. So something like this, for example, happens every, I would say three months. They have to create a new repository. They just like open up pull request, adding a new line like that, and then um, um, they don't have to do anything else. Huh? Um, previously, it was like that. Um, people were creating um, these repositories by hand. So every time you do that, of course, you can make a mistake. You can uh, forget something, some, some setting. Uh, so it was a bit of a mess. Huh? So uh, with this approach, now we, uh, we're really making sure that all the repositories um, in all the projects um, they can be as consistent as the project decides to. Huh? If the project doesn't care, okay. Uh, it's not that magically everything will be uh, fixed, huh? but uh, the projects have uh, the ability and the power now to actually uh, clean up their uh, repositories as much as, as much as possible. Especially this Adoption project was doing this uh, very carefully, I would say. They made uh, a configuration that was super clean and, and trying to uh, apply all the best uh, practices uh, that were, or that are currently um, yeah, state of the art. Um, then the nice uh, side effect of having a, a configuration like that uh, for every uh, project is you can collect this information <laughs> and process it. Eh? So we uh, also uh, created a, a web interface uh, for this application that, that we were developing that collects all this information and displays them in some, um, yeah, uh, in some way to basically get immediate insights about the status of these uh, repositories and projects. So, so similar to, to what GitHub does, of course. So GitHub has, has lots of uh, charts and, 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 and trends about uh, certain security-related features. So we try to, to do something similar, but however, we have to say that we are not GitHub, so we are relatively small, but we started with this like um, one and a half years ago. At the time, certain things were not there from GitHub side, so we, we had a natural need to actually do that ourselves. At the time, of course, uh, uh, GitHub catched up, or basically they uh, do things in an incredible pace, of course, uh, because they are much uh, bigger. Um, also, we don't try to compete with GitHub in this regard. It's just like we would like to extract and, and display the information that is really relevant for us. Huh? Um, um, one nice thing is also uh, that we have is, I mean, if you were looking at the JSONnet configuration, um, it's not straightforward. So it's not something that you can write in a text uh, editor and then immediately know what's, what's going on. Um, for that reason, uh, we have also a playground where you can uh, build up your, your snippets of code that you would like to add to your configuration file and see the exact effect uh, of, of, uh, of this snippet. Huh? So um, what actually JSONnet will do is it will um, um, manifest a JSON file. Huh? So it will take all the, 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 the settings that were inherited from the default configuration uh, take the, the uh, overwritten properties uh, in, in this case and then basically create uh, a JSON document um, that is fully manifested with all uh, settings. So with this uh, small little playground, you can uh, immediately see uh, the effect of, uh, of the configuration change that you would like to do. Um, so how does it then actually work for, um, for a project? So um, when we set up um, um, this service for a project, we create this uh, .eclipse FDN repo, imported from, from GitHub, and then a project can uh, take a look, and if they would like to make a change, what do they do? 
they fork the repo. Um, they create a branch with the requested changes in, uh, to the JSON act configuration, and then they create a pull, uh, pull request to the upstream repo. Huh? Um, so what then happens next? So when the pull request is being created, um, uh, the, the pull request will uh, get automatically validated uh, to provide a quick feedback uh, if the changes are syntactically correct, but also, uh, and this is a relatively important uh, part, is that GitHub actually supports this type of changes huh? because uh, there are a few requirements, constraints on, on various resources on, by GitHub that are not apparent. <laughs> Um, sometimes the UI helps you to actually uh, avoid mistakes, but if you uh, just describe the configuration in a text file, you can easily make mistakes, and we don't want to we don't want to have a situation where people uh, create a pull request, make changes, and then when you're trying to apply these changes, it fails. So we try to capture all the things that are not supported or not possible already up front, provide feedback to the user to see, ah, this is not possible, or you forgot this setting, or this setting is not uh, valid, whatever, um, and, and show that uh, in the pull request to the user. So you can also then fix uh, either the, the, the pull request himself, or we, we help them uh, as much as possible uh, to, 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 uh, to, to get things faster uh, done. So this is uh, a, a, typ a typical uh, output of a pull request, for example, um, Somebody wants to add a, a webhook. Uh, you see all the changes that uh, are going to be applied. So in this case, um, yeah, a webhook is added with the settings. Uh, and if uh, this then gets merged into the repository, um, it gets automatically applied. <coughs> so here is an example of, of a validation error. Uh, so when something is actually not uh, possible or not allowed, then we uh, indicate that to the user and also prevent that the uh, pull request gets merged to avoid yeah, any problems. Um, so the reason why this is actually not colored is because simply uh, in, in GitHub uh, <laughs> issues, uh, it's not so easy to uh, actually add color codes. Um, we found here in this case uh, a way to support uh, colors um, by simply using the diff style uh, uh, prefixes, plus, minus, actually uh, indicate uh, 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 this, this colors, uh, but for others it's, it's not possible. And so it, I, at least I personally didn't find a way to, to add uh, colors to uh, GitHub comments on, on issues and PRs. Um, okay, so um, this is uh, then the example when everything is like green. Um, it can be merged because it validates correctly, it's approved also by a project lead. If this is the case, uh, we added a functionality that, that people can actually merge themselves. They add a comment to the PR and uh, then the app detects that automatically and applies the changes. Uh, also report what changes have been applied for, for double checking um, and if something goes wrong because that also can, can happen from time to time. Sometimes GitHub API also has some outages. So you have to then fix that uh, afterwards uh, by reapplying the change again. But yeah, okay, that's relatively rare, but it can happen. Um, yeah, so, uh, so far I showed you um, how to define a configuration, how to change the configuration, um, and what about policies? So the talk about uh, the title of the talk is, is about policy, policing uh, open source repositories or projects. Um, so far, I mainly talked about changing configuration in a relatively convenient or automated way. Um, so that's what we try to achieve so far. So we make the configuration visible and transparent, make uh, a support self-service as, as much as possible and increase acceptance of the solution within our community. I think we, we really managed to, to achieve that. Um, and our next step is actually to uh, integrate also really policies that enforce certain things or, in, in a lighter case, really steer projects in the right direction. Um, so far, we, we started with one policy <laughs> um, out of a need. Um, so 
GitHub recently uh, added support for macOS large runners um, that you can use in GitHub Actions. Um, they are really powerful and really nice to uh, speed up your, your workflows uh, in case you use macOS. The downside is they incur a relatively high cost. Um, so once your uh, enterprise or I think team is, is the minimum, uh, you are entitled to use them. The downside is you cannot limit the use. <laughs> so everybody can write a, a workflow uh, that uses a large runner and it will just work. Um, the downside is your billing goes up. Um, so when you control uh, in a range of 200 uh, projects with uh, thousands of repositories, um, um, you actually would like to know upfront if somebody is increasing your billing <laughs> instead of uh, post-mortem. So we uh, had the case where um, projects were already using that um, and we could uh, uh, still stop that at this point because otherwise it would, uh, yeah, um, the, the, the costs would run away. Uh, and the idea was actually to use our existing uh, system to control whether an organization is entitled to use such runners, yes or no. Because some projects, they are, because they have some additional... Um, we call it resource bag that allows them to use more resources, whatever. Um, and we would like to use this system that we developed to actually control whether uh, they are permitted to use such uh, large runners. And so we defined a policy um, that um, is then defined in the same repository uh, as, uh, as the configuration, as, as you have seen before, that uh, specifies whether they are allow allowed to, to use such runners. And then the application uh, automatically listens to every workflow run that is being uh, started for all uh, repositories. And if the project is entitled to use that, then let's run it. If not, then cancel that, uh, that workflow run uh, to avoid uh, uh, that uh, additional costs are being incurred. And so that was uh, a, a very nice uh, use case to uh, develop and, and deploy our first policy. But of course, we, we don't want to st stop there. So um, uh, the next couple of, of weeks and months, uh, we uh, plan to uh, work on more policies um, to do things like enforcing secret scanning for all repos because it's you, you get it for free, um, as I already said before. Uh, one important uh, thing is, uh, for example, to make sure that all the actions that you use in your GitHub uh, workflows are pinned to a specific version um, because um, due to the nature how GitHub Actions work, um, they are not immutable. Um, so you have to pin them to, to certain um, uh, sharp versions, uh, sharp, uh, commit, ver um, commit hashes uh, in order to prevent that, uh, for example, malicious versions of an action could be injected uh, into, into your workflows. Um, another uh, useful policy would be to um, uh, ensure that uh, at least the default branches uh, of repositories have branch protection rules or rule sets, which are basically the same. Um, another important fact uh, that uh, also uh, other people have already talked about lots, uh, lots is, is that every repository should have a security ND file. Uh, simply to uh, uh, document, uh, also to the community, to the users, how uh, is the project going to handle security uh, vulnerabilities and where to report them. So that's uh, I would say relatively important. Uh, many repositories are still missing that, and uh, I think that would be uh, a very good target to uh, to tackle uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, um, not many time, uh, not much time left. But uh, I would just wanted to give you some uh, screenshots to 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 get you an idea of of what the system is supporting. So we have a dashboard where we see uh, all the um, uh, organizations, uh, all the repositories, all the pull requests that have been opened and uh, how they have been handled, some uh, um, graphs about um, certain things that we deem to be uh, important right now, how well they have been already adopted by our projects, uh, where are areas where we still need to invest time to, um, or effort to, uh, to convince our projects to enable these settings, for example, or with policies to slightly uh, push them in this direction. Uh, we also have a query interface uh, that's very beta, I would say, 
um, but it allows you in uh, GraphQL uh, to basically uh, get information about uh, settings of repositories and, 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 and retrieve these repositories that match these settings that you would like to uh, query for. Um, this is the part uh, that made it quite important that we have our own solution because we don't want to only enforce the policy to the, uh, to the repositories, but we also would like to get information about what is the current configuration. Because we would like to get uh, uh, to use this uh, information uh, to feed that into other systems or other uh, web pages, documentation, to give uh, you an indication about the status of, of, of projects. And so we have um, a project that's called Metrics where we uh, indicate to our community uh, the current status of, of a certain project. Uh, for example, how much uh, contributions uh, did it get the last couple of uh, weeks or months? Um, how many uh, uh, committers has this project? And one of the uh, parts that is quite important is also about security. Does this project adhere to the best practices uh, for uh, software supply chain security? And here you can see, uh, for example, one, one simple example uh, that is directly derived from the configuration um, that is captured um, in this dot eclipse FDN repo. So, so we get this information for, for each uh, repository or project in this case, collect, uh, analyze the data, and then display a graph about that, for example. So that's, that's uh, I would say, one of the, uh, the main reasons why we uh, developed our own solution, uh, to be able to do st stuff like that. Um, maybe at the end, um, what lessons have we learned uh, from this approach? Um, of course, we, we use a bit of uh, our own uh, DSL uh, using JSONnet, um, which is a bit of a hurdle for, for projects at first. Um, you have to learn something new. Not everybody is willing to do that. Um, but usually people were pretty quick to, to pick up uh, how this works with the existing documentation that we have and also with uh, the examples of, of various projects that already use that um, actively in, in, in their day-to-day uh, -day business. Um, so once people get used to, to how this works, they actually uh, also see um, the beauty of being able to have uh, a very consistent set of configuration for your uh, project or organization. What I personally uh, really like a lot uh, about uh, this approach is that um, the workflow to make changes to the configuration is basically the same as uh, when you would do uh, code changes. So it, it completely fits into uh, your existing workflow. That's, that's very natural for you. Um, it also uh, allows you to communicate about changes with your project team. So is this the right thing to do? Yes or no? Should we do this or that? So it, it uh, really empowers also the community to, to, to work together and, and to come to, uh, to a decision that uh, everybody accepts. So, um, it's of course much quicker to get uh, configuration changes uh, applied compared to opening help, help test tickets, tickets, that's clear. Um, and I think that's also one lesson. Uh, it really allows you to, to come with a very clean concise and consistent configuration. But of course, you have to do some effort. Uh, if you just like leave things as they are, nothing will magically uh, be clean afterwards. But uh, you have the tools at hand uh, to actually do that. Huh? So you can relatively easily enable, for example, secret scanning for all your repos. It's just like opening up the, the configuration file, uh, set it to true everywhere, or basically remove uh, the line everywhere because the default is already true. Um, and, and off you go. Um, the negative sides are, and this was uh, raised at least by one guy, it doesn't have an UI. So of course, in, in some cases, it, it's more appealing to have an UI because you immediately see all the available options uh, and you uh, know what you can change. Uh, so that's the downside of, of an approach like that. That's clear. Um, and another thing that we learned that's more on the technical side is um, secondary rate limits of GitHub. <laughs> so with the approach that we have, uh, the solution that we designed, um, 
we make lots and lots of requests to GitHub to get the current configuration. And we want to do that as fast as possible because you don't want to wait for, uh, for this information. So we try to speed this up as much as possible, but then we realize uh, if, you, if you try to uh, try too hard, then you uh, yeah, hit uh, secondary rate limits of, of GitHub quite easily. So they have some limits, let's say maximum 100 requests uh, in parallel, maximum, I don't know, 1,000 points per minute, something like this. So you have to be uh, careful about stuff like that. But uh, apart from that, um, the experience was quite positive and uh, the API that GitHub offers is also uh, quite powerful and, and quite consistent, I would say. Yeah. Happy to work with that. Um, yeah. Uh, at the end, I, I would like to mention that uh, the work that we have done so far uh, was supported by the Alpha Omega uh, initiative, uh, and we are really grateful and thankful for, for the support. Uh, otherwise, it would not have been possible. Um, yeah. So thanks for your uh, uh, attendance, and uh, if you have any questions, Yeah, indeed. So uh, some other tools, like I think the, the GitHub Safe Settings uh, support, something like this. Uh, we also have thought about that. Uh, we have not done it yet. Uh, there was not a big need from, the, from our community to do that, but it makes absolutely sense, and uh, it would not be too difficult to add there. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, um, something that uh, we have not yet supported, uh, which we also would like to do, is um, everything is like in one configuration file, but uh, sometimes you have the case where you have a, a relatively large organization with sub-projects in them. And you would like to have, say, uh, this sub-project controls that part, this sub-project controls that part, and, and this is something that, that we would like to do out of a need uh, of our project also. So that's natural, yeah. yeah. So you, you mean about injecting uh, secrets via uh, workflows? So um, we support basically defining secrets in the configuration file. Um, but what do you mean, uh, mean with uh, preventing? Okay, I see. Um, um, if you have a need for something like this, you can certainly uh, add a, a policy for that. Huh? But uh, right now we don't have this uh, because there was no need so far. But yeah. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, I did not touch that yet um, uh, because in, in our case, we have like a s separate uh, systems that are responsible for provisioning of uh, resources and setting permissions. So there is another script that basically uh, runs every couple of hours, checks all re uh, repositories that are being created for all the organizations that we have, uh, that we own and sets permissions for, for the committers that have the rights to write to this uh, repository. So this happens outside of the system. However, 
it also could be added. It's just like we don't have a need for that so far uh, because we have a separate system that actually does that. Uh, so this, this would be defined by the organization uh, configuration. Uh, so on, on an organization uh, level, you can define uh, what is the default permission uh, for for uh, for new repo? Huh? So if if you don't specify explicitly uh, what permissions uh, uh, or what what users should be having access to this repository, you can define on organization level. Okay, for example, every uh, member has read permissions or write permissions on every repository. If you don't want that, you you need to have like an additional uh, system that actually sets up the permissions for you. Huh? The tool so far doesn't do it. However, it, nothing prevents it to, to add this functionality, yeah? but we just don't have a need for that so far. Yeah? But okay, what was the another question? Uh, so uh, for the APIs, it, it, it relies on GitHub, of course. Yeah? So this is uh, now uh, only for, for GitHub work for repositories hosted on GitHub. However, uh, at Eclipse Foundation, we also have uh, repositories hosted on, on our own GitLab instance. Uh, we would like to do the same also for that. Of course, it will be different because GitLab is different than GitHub. Um, but it's uh, very generic and abstract in this regard. Uh, so you you have like uh, different providers um, for different uh, source uh, code uh, platforms or rep uh, repository providers. And uh, right now we focused on GitHub because I would say 70% of our projects are on GitHub. Um, so we try to low hanging fruits. Eh? So th this first, uh, but the next step would also be to, uh, to um, extend that to, to GitLab. Okay, then uh, if there are no more questions, then thanks for your um, attendance.